Hello, everybody. And, uh, thank you, Eric, for joining us today. Thank you for having us. It's great to be here. And we're such a young SIG, and it's really it's an opportunity for us to come and try to explain who we are yeah, and yeah. things like that. So that thank, was, thanks for having us. That was definitely part of my thinking. Like, right. Like, like, you, um, so maybe just to begin, could, like the other two interviews, could you um, personally introduce yourself first? Hello, everybody. <laughs> my name's Eric Hawkinson. Please call me Eric. Uh, originally from Arizona in the States. I've been in Japan about 15 years, living in, uh, I call it upstate Kyoto. <laughs> <laughs> And, and um, I recently moved to Kyoto. We just started a new school at the Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. It's called the School of Global Engagement. And I designed some courses for our track in global tourism. So uh, I haven't started teaching them yet, but uh, as soon as our students get to the second and third year, I'll be teaching courses like New Media Marketing and Tourism, uh, New Media Lab, Mice Theory, and um, digital literacy. So uh, issues related to our digital self and our digital society, how it relates to how we live and travel and communicate, basically, in general. Great. Thank you very much. And there's a, you, you mentioned tourism there, and I have a question about that. I so noticed, yeah. <laughs> um, um, in terms of the mixed, augmented virtual realities um, SIG, <laughs> could you tell us about your, it's a very new SIG, it maybe started, is it just two years ago? Um, yeah, well, technically, we started just over a year ago, and our first presentation as a group, as a form, forming SIG, was at this PANSIG just last year. So, in a sense, this is our first year anniversary, in a way, coming back to PANSIG. So, we're very, very young, very, very new, and still trying to find our footing in many ways. Right. And, um, yeah, could you tell us about the, the kind of the focuses of your... I, right. I imagine there's many judging well. <laughs> So yeah, this is um, yeah, because on the surface, um, many people have the maybe the, the tendency to think about this as technology based, with the tools that are coming out. Um, but a lot of our members feel that it's not just ma mainly about the technology, the virtual technology, which is iterating and coming out faster and faster. Which we, if on the surface you looked at our papers and our our communications, you'll see some new fancy tools or apps or things that we're trying to share and focus on, but. On the deeper aspect of it, um, we're trying to focus on what these represent moving forward. And I think maybe if you want to, there's many ways to describe it, but disruption is one way to think about it, right? Because um, uh, Michael McLuhan has a famous quote, we, we make our tools and thereafter they shape us, right? So the internet age has caused us to communicate and interact with each other in very unique and new ways. And we think these new things that are coming out represent another paradigm shift in the way this is happening. And we're trying to navigate that and figure our own way as we move into this, this new area. So yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, that's <laughs> And um, kind of just, I guess, to exemplify that, uh, yes, I attended your forum, your six forum. Great, thanks for coming. And you, um, I, I went there as a complete beginner, novice, not knowing anything. And um, I think there were five presentations and they all yes. dealt with very different areas of um, Yes, it's very diverse. We're, yeah. Um, can you give us a, maybe a few examples of, of what, what took place yesterday? Oh, great. And how it relates to what you just said. Perfect. Yeah, we're very excited about the, the variety and scope that just came out. Because we're, again, just one year later, we had one presentation. And one year later, we had six very diverse, very interesting applications and uses of uh, this idea that we're presenting forward. And, uh, there's a spectrum there too, because thinking about realities, right? We're all in this quote-unquote real world, and we can debate if we're in that right now as well. <laughs> but there's virtu virtual elements, digital elements being incorporated in, in very different ways. And so we had some technical people like developing apps and creating new technologies and uses and new tools for us. And then on the other side of it, we had some people with some very passionate, very unique social causes that we're trying to connect using, connect people and ideas with using this technology. So for example, we had Parissa and uh, Elizabeth talk about how they're using augmented reality to connect uh, both students and teachers in Japan with those that affected by the hurricane in Puerto Rico. Um, there was an academic writings uh, 
story by Jen Teeter where she's putting students in virtual worlds to experience what it's like to become a refugee and kind of go through the paces of going and being making the decision to leave your home and the consequences and choices you have to make along the way to then inspire or inform students into maybe maybe taking a different perspective in the way in the voice that they which they want to write about these situations so the immersiveness of that technology and how that might affect your own thinking as as you approach academic writing and then on the other side of things we have some people developing some new cool fascinating uh, applications and tools. Ewan Bonner and Aaron Frazier had a short talk about a new app they're developing where they place cubes around campus and you can use this app and this dancing monkey will show you around campus. They kind of run around with look almost like a Pokemon Go example and um, tell you where to go and what's available on campus, like a individualized, customized virtual tour of campus kind of thing. So yeah, um, some of, some, of the, some, of the, some of the ideas I had yesterday was that like this technology is I guess supplementing but also transforming and um, kind of opening the students up to um, yeah beyond I guess the reality of the classroom. It's kind of bringing multiple realities into the into the space. If that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so well, it makes sense to me. All of that <laughs> on the spot there. Um, changing the topic slightly to. Um, Talk, thinking about the um, the formation of the SIG itself, and I guess for a lot of people in the JALC family, they may not see the differences between uh, the JALC call SIG and, and your SIG. Um, what what are the differences? How do they right. differ or overlap? Um, well, there are similarities and there are differences, and this has been a question that's come up quite often, actually. And I kind of touched on it before. It's not necessarily about the technology. It's about what it represents. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you want to talk about call in general, which a lot of our members also are a member of call and they do other technological or if you're developing apps, you're also working in that space as well. So there's overlap, of course. But <clears throat> you talk about call and then that evolved into mall and maybe tall and then yeah. each step along the way there's this evolution of how you see and view the technology in that in that technology in general but as a medium right so we had the computer age and a lot of universities they've had call rooms forever and then we're moving into the mobile age but each that step also had a paradigm shift on how we use and communicate with each other but now it's this this digital contest is becoming so ubiquitous so everywhere, it's jumping out. We have it on our pockets right now, but it's going to be so much everywhere. This is going to be another step, another change, another paradigm shift. And we believe that's that's where it starts to break away from the traditional call, one-to-one yeah. -one computing type stuff or the mobile learning type stuff. It's just, it's less, almost less about the technology and more about how it, uh, how humans are interacting with digital concepts and digital content rather than the tools itself. Um, <clears throat> thinking about the evolution of mass media, right? So the we had the TV. There was a meme yesterday. Um, what was the meme? Uh, 40 years ago, your mom was telling you, st get back from the TV, you're too close, and now we're putting them right two inches in front of our face. <laughs> so, but... Um, <clears throat> That jump, right? So the TV, we, we were worried about that, and that was kind of the beginning of the call era, like the, the, the interactive media, the immersive media, and now the internet changed that to where we were interacting with each other, not just passively accepting it, but now we're entering into another shift where it's just so behind the scenes and everywhere that it's yeah. almost unthinkable, and when we're, we're thinking about concepts like, well, what happens if it goes away? It's like losing a part of your brain, right? This is... We're, we're already not remembering phone numbers as much because we have them accessed in our pockets. What if we have a phone in our face that tells us people's names and their backgrounds automatically? Are we going to remember names less? These are the kinds of things that are starting to break away, we feel, from, from call in general. But yeah. Yeah. also, we just want to, we feel ourselves as disruptors too. We want to be able to have some freedom and flexibility. So that's another reason why we wanted right. to do something separate and different. And um, I guess, like, I guess you've answered my name next question, but do you think the establishment of your SIG is reflective of, I guess, the wider society of um, 
people using this kind of technology in, in the, not just in the classroom, but in their daily lives. Right. Um, Has one kind of followed the other? Or well, uh, JALT is mainly, right, we're talking about language learning in general, but a lot of our members and our membership is thinking about how this is going to change in general society and how we communicate with each other, right? Think about if you could appear, that Gail was up here just before us, what if you could appear to other people as any gender you wanted to, right? You can, you can now shape and mold your own identity in a digital form however you want, right? So this has implications in how we present ourselves and how we view ourselves more than just thinking about the tools and the technology itself. It's more reflective about our humanity in general. Yeah. Um, so moving on now to teacher development, and um, I'll, I'll read my question. It's, it's quite a long one. So, um, although developments in mixed, augmented, and virtual reality have been going on for some time, perhaps uh, many teachers have still yet to incorporate these tools into their classroom. Um, firstly, how could um, perhaps I maybe uh, talk about myself? How could you encourage me or me as the collective teacher um, to? take up this technology in the classroom? What, what would be the first steps? Because um, when I see boxes like this, right? This one? Is this intimidating to you at it's all? It's intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just wondering how we, how we, what would you tell the novice teacher? And, um, right. Where's, where's the starting point, I guess? Yeah, I mean, the, a lot of, we have some members that are not technically minded at all, and I want to make that clear. This is not necessarily about the technology, it's about how it affects us and how we, we use it to communicate and use it for each other. So, just pointed to this device here, this just came out. This is a new device, right? This has only been available for a week, and you just strap basically an uh, entertainment device to your face and you have it walking around. But it's a lot of fun, so <laughs> you can get something like that, of course, but if you want to just hop into what people are doing, you can. There are tools and very inexpensive ways to just try out the technology. One very inexpensive thing is called Google Cardboard. So it's basically a box, a cardboard box, and you put your phone in it, right. and you can maybe uh, view some 360 immersive video. So. We are used to watching what the director of a film wants us to see, right? They're pointed the camera in a specific way. They cut the scenes in a specific way to help us feel and, and emote to that situation. But 360 video is helping us change that thought pattern, right? Because now you can buy this cardboard device, put your phone in it, and you can your the director can't tell you what to look at and how to feel, all right? Well, there's music in the background, of course, but you can just simply experience life from somebody else's perspective and you can experience it in a way that you have enough input into it where you feel like you have some some um, agency in from that perspective as well so google cardboard and 360 video is as a tool wise is a great place to start um is is there a danger with with this technology as there is with all the technology that um the, the, the wow factor kind okay. of gets in the way of um I think I went to a presentation by Stephen Bax um, some years ago, and he talked. To, he kind of he, he was kind of trying to warn us of um, not being blinded by the technology, but trying to think: is this going to be? Is this going to lead to pedagogically sound right. principles and outcomes? And um, yeah, what would you say to those kind of skeptics? I guess. <clears throat> It's what I feel like what our SIG is some of the most important work that we should be doing is trying to be a little more skeptical about the technology because on the the commercial side of it, right, um, they're selling this as the next great thing, right? This is going to transform the world, which it is, but of course they're reluctant to talk about some of the implications and the dangers and the um, problems inherent with this technology. And one of them is... is the data gathering aspect of it. We already had seen some trouble with Facebook and the Cambridge Analytica stuff. And this technology is going to exacerbate that in ways we haven't even begun to think of yet, right? So think about using an immersive technology. Not only do you can gather data about where that person is and how they're using it, you now know where, what they're looking at, how they're experiencing it, and how they're using that technology. So you're gathering even like even 
medical information about people in ways that we haven't even begun to understand. So that's one of the hopefully more important work that we want to try and help focus on and communicate to the larger world in general about mainly privacy issues and how this affects something called the divided brain, right? So we've seen this with the Pokemon Go example, right? So people are climbing fences to get into private areas to hunt for virtual things that aren't there in the real world. So your your mind is now half there in the real world and half there in the divided. We're already seeing this on the, you go any plat, train platform in Japan and people are looking down at their phones because they're half with their virtual uh, identity and lives and half there in the real world. So this is going to become a, an even bigger and heavier trend as we start moving forward. All right. Thank you. <coughs> and go, going back to um, teacher development, um, could you tell us some stories about how maybe members of your SIG or people using um, this kind of technology have, um, I guess, developed their techniques as teachers or you um, tell us some stories, maybe further afield too, um, about how teachers have begun to incorporate this into their classes? Uh, there's a ton of great stuff that's happening in classes with the technology stuff, um, talking about putting students in different places and different identities, for example, uh, the Jen Teeter example before with the um, the refugee stories, right? But in general, um, we're going on trips now for, in the classroom to places that we could never go before, right? Uh, one of our members, Parisa, has been taking students and trying to break their stereotypes of Iran by taking them into beautiful mosques and to the snow top mountains of Iran where this is not the usual thing that students perceive of that place, right? So uh, something called Google Expeditions where you can take a whole classroom on a virtual field trip to anywhere um, and um, even places that you might not even think of, like not, not, not actually a physical place on earth, but you can take students into you know, the heart of a DNA stru structure or on the surface of Pluto or um, examples like that in the classroom too, yeah. But in general, as far as teacher development goes, I think what this technology can represent, there was a comment earlier about SIGs being uh, geographically separated and this technology is allowing us to embody actually physical avatars and be have that feeling of proximity to each other uh, using this technology, so moving forward as far as teacher development, we, yeah. you can you can see uh, this being used more and more as people to be able to get together and share talks and have the conversations like you. This this TD was I guess looking to share right to share conversations, so you can have some feel more feeling of proximity to each other using these more immersive technologies to share the conversations that yeah. you have. Just um, something you mentioned earlier, you mentioned about tourism, and I'm, I currently work in a tourism faculty, and right. I'm thinking about how can I incorporate, because I've seen recently um, tourism agencies have started to use, um, I think, uh, was it Bobby here? Bobby, yes, please. <laughs> um, he did, uh, gave a virtual tour of a campus uh, using um, virtual reality, I believe. Um, could you speak about tourism in general, and how, right. could, how could this affect tourism? <clears throat> Yeah, Bobby uh, Figueroa yesterday was at our um, forum, and he he, represent, he showed us a, a tour, a virtual tour he's created for students, so they don't have necessarily have to come to campus. They can come and see what ca campus is like. And some of our other members are doing tours of uh, pre before you go study abroad, pre study abroad stuff, to so uh -huh. see if that might reduce anxiety. So students are actually walking from where they might stay with a host family to campus, mm -hmm. right? things like that so before you go so you're more concentrated on your studies and things are less concentrated on the moment of where you have to be or yeah, where you have yeah. to go and stressing yeah. about that uh, but tourism yes I, I didn't know that you worked in a tourism so we just started this new I mentioned that at the top but we just started this new faculty in Kyoto uh, global tourism track and um, the classes I've designed are mainly focused on the technology side of it and it's being used more and more right. and <clears throat> Maybe this is tangential, but the big question I have is, maybe you can all think about this question yourselves, is if you could virtually travel anywhere and kind of feel like you've been there, is that going to encourage more international travel in the future, or is that going to maybe curtail? I think both. <laughs> it just means that um, 
the way people want to experience their travel is going to be changing because of the technology. So more than using the technology to promote uh, marketing is on the internet is a big thing for travel now too, and it, and um, uh, word of mouth is a big thing. So you want people, you want to be able to encourage people to share their experiences because the proximity, the friendship you have on social media is more important than advertising dollars these days. But <clears throat> more than that, um, the the way that you're developing your tourism destinations, the focus of it, yeah. it needs to start evolving because if you are a Basically, basically, let's say you're a scenery, like the whole attraction of your tourism destination is this beautiful scene and you don't offer any other experience. Therefore, your t virtual visit has done 90% of what you would go there and yes. spend money on uh, a, a meal and taxi drive and all that stuff that the tourism dollars and the people developing tourism want to, yeah. to increase. So. It's it, more than just using the technology to just understand how people's expectations and needs and um, and uh, the way they want to experience tourism uh, might need to evolve because yeah. of the technology. Yeah. Okay, and then one final question, uh, just and also thinking ahead, um, what what's your future vision for your your SIG or your your uh, office? We're so young. It's just <laughs> it's um, we. Well, when we started, we want, like I said, we, we want to, because we're, we feel like we're working with disruptions, we want to try to make a place where we can allow people to try new things and maybe fail at a couple of things, because if that doesn't happen, we're not really pushing the boundaries and learning from and expecting some of the changes that might come on a broader scale for society and, and education in general. So we want to provide a nice, safe environment for and a flexible environment. So we tried, to, like for example, when we trying to form our charter and our, our constitution, we just ripped out a bunch of the stuff that Jolt told us to write, and we just were, were sticking to a set of values, right? Inclusivity, um, trying things new, and things like that. So uh, we're trying to use these values to guide us moving forward, but we really don't want to set yeah. a particular goal because that's going to impede on our ability to kind of go with the flow because this. Technology is iterating and changing at such a fast pace. Well, that's great place to end it. Um, thank you very much, Eric. Thanks, Matt. Thank so I guess now we'll we'll kind of we have thirty minutes still. Um, perhaps we, we may use the whole time. We may not. But um, what I guess I'd like for us to do now is to invite our our um, interviewees back up to the front. Um, if that's okay. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'll get another chance. Um, and what we'd like, what we'd like for you to do now is to um, just kind of reflect on each what you heard from each other today. And um, were there any overlaps, commonalities? Um, were there any questions that you had for each other? And I've written a few of my own questions, which I'll save for later. And also, we'll take your questions too, if, if you have any. I hope the glare there is OK. But we'll see. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, you've got you've got this right here. This is you can see the reflective disguise. It's actually it's it's on the last okay. slide. That's, that's the end. <laughs> yeah, um, perhaps. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Can <laughs> <laughs> perhaps. Sorry about that. That's all right. Can perhaps we'll start with you. Do you have any comments uh, from the session today? Yeah, it's hard to follow um, augmented reality presentation because it's so intriguing to everybody. Oh. Everyone's like, yeah, show us the glass, show us this. I'm like, well, I can sing the hello, how are you? <laughs> you know, so, uh, <laughs> That's a reality, too, though. It's an important one. <laughs> it's a daily reality. Right? Um, no, I guess uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how we can incorporate technology in the classrooms in the younger learners area. When we do do it, I feel for a decent amount, you know, we have you know, the iPads and we do a lot of virtual things and we try to get the kids engaged with it, but I don't know if I'm looking forward to or intimidated by the day when I see my five-year-old with goggles on walking around the classroom, you know, but you know, we'll see, so 
yeah, if we're having a conversation about it, even Bill Gates and Steve Jobs don't let their kids use yeah. these devices. So it tells you something about how they view the technology. But if I'm going to ask you a question, like you, a dis dis dispatch company as well, and so, we yeah, we so um, one of the things, like I touched on earlier, is the privacy issue and. Higher ed has a little more flexibility with this because we're working with young adults, but in elementary school, junior high school, and even in high school, there are already a lot of laws in place in Japan to protect kids from being represented on social media and things like that. And this technology being used in classroom, whether a lot of teachers understand it or not, can invade on their privacy even in deeper ways. So in your experience, have you had any pushback on or or issues or questions that have arisen from working with the public schools on maybe using technology like this? Or? I mean, with, with the public schools, we're, yes, you know, they hire us to come in there and do the lesson. Oh, I see. And we design the curriculum, but we're literally just the, the, the face mm -hmm. uh, for a short period of time. So we don't have much say. Uh, and then they have us come there for special events and stuff. But with, you know, with our schools, uh, and the four kindergartens and five preschools we have, you know, we're heavily involved in social media, and we, I, I would say, probably a five percent pushback as far as, you know, don't put my kids' face mm -hmm. on it. And, and of course, we respect that to the utmost. It makes it challenging for the teachers because at the end of the day, before they post and they're looking through each one, and, and you know, and they're so diligent in that. Um, so whether it's the blog, Instagram, Facebook, or just uh, marketing material, you know, we have to be very cognizant and aware. So, but it's not that big of a, a deal, at least with us. Mm -hmm. I don't know, um, at our schools, parents are pretty, pretty open to it. Great. So, yeah, great. Can we ask also? For sure. Oh, question? you want me? Sure, okay. Okay, actually, <laughs> um, I thought the, the first question that Michael asked me, I'd like to turn it and ask him okay. Eric the same question where he said, you know, in 2017, Japan dropped by three places to 114th in the World Economic Forum Gender Equality Ranking. Uh -huh. And so, how do you see MAVER, you know, and this, these new technologies, how they can be uh, utilized in the educational context uh, to Disrupt. <laughs> that was one of your key words. Yeah. Right? Um, Patty, you want to take a crack at that one? <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> um, well, we often talk about a lot of this immersive technology. It's been been called an uh, empathy machine. Yeah. And uh, it's been walked around a bunch. So, like, um, there's been some movie directors trying to put you in the shoes of other people and other places and other situations and allow you, give you some agency and because you have a, a little bit of agency, even if it's just being able to look around and see the people you want to see in another person's shoes, gives you a new perspective, a new insight into their lives or that and it could be another culture, it could be another gender. Um, and I think this could be very um, a good thing is, and if you want to tie it to education, we're al we're already using our kids are already using this technology to try out new identities, try out new forms. Like um, you might have a son or daughter swapping genders in an online game that happens just to try it out and to see what it feels like and see what that world is to you. And these technologies can allow you to do that in new ways that we may have not even begun to think about yet. I, I hope you'll promote that expression, empathy machines, more and more, because I think a lot of people have the sense that technology, that it, that it will have a negative effect on empathy. Mm -hmm. And so if you can really, I think it's really important to promote that it can have that positive effect. Yeah. You have to be open to it, though. Yeah. Just have to get rid of the comment sections. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> The, the, there's also this issue of distance and anonymity when it comes to online communication, right? So if you don't have that immediate reaction of knowing you've disappointed or hurt someone that's right in front of you, that's one of the things that's leading to all this visceral and lashing out, especially, like, it's part of that, what I just mentioned earlier about exploring identities, right? So as, even as adults, but kids do it especially, like, they try and provoke people or try out new things just to see if they cross the boundary or two. 
and you're doing this online and not necessarily getting that immediate feedback and so it becomes louder that 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 visceral outbreak and so you have people who are going online and just giving these really horrible it's reading the comment section on youtube sometimes is very very disheartening thing but <laughs> yeah you know, so the problems of trolling, cyberbullying, right? Ghosting. Yeah. So, yeah, so <laughs> trying to find them ways to disrupt those, too. Yeah. You know, one of the big challenges. Well, I mean, just the change in its own story. So I'm thinking about gender and intersectionality. How, how and in what way should we be introducing this to our younger learners? Younger. That's really not so, my expertise, and you know. Something that I was thinking yeah. about is the inventory that we use from an early stage and dealing with politics. I think that's definitely a level uh, and an issue where I, I don't really feel qualified to answer. I just spent my whole career in in upper, but anyone else? Yeah, better than Gail. Um, just that as long as I do not teach younger learners now, but. I have kids, and um, I work with them. Anyway, you do it at an age appropriate level, point blank. I mean, there's physical things, or like, and anyway, there's details that you know, a five year old or six year old or something like can't necessarily process. You know, so, of course, we need to find a way that's appropriate for the age of the Having a teacher like me, <laughs> who's dealing with like all problems because of intersectionality, uh, so I think yeah, um, they can see me. <laughs> yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Age appropriate is probably a subjective term, but it's probably, in my opinion, experience, best to err on the side of overestimating your learners. Um, when I've tried to bring things that I was worried about that I thought might not go over well. My students tend to really impress me. So if you're if you're hesitant, you know, go for it. The only thing I would add to that is the, the issue of the problem of, of the teacher's own implicit biases mm -hmm. and the possibility that we are also, you know, uh, unconsciously indoctrinating young learners who were really more open and sort of um, planting our own prejudices and implicit biases into them. If I could just, maybe, I don't know if this will really help with young learners or not, but one very interesting research done by a Gale member who was one of our speakers at Dalt last year, Beiko Yoshihara, has this fascinating research where she did two surveys, one teacher survey and one student survey. You may, some of you may be familiar with this. She asked the teachers, what topics do you think students are interested in learning about. And she also asked specifically, do you think they're interested in learning about, say, gender issues, um, LGBTI issues? And so I said, no, no, we don't think our students are interested in that. The students already say, so the students are all saying, yes, we want to learn gender issues. Yes, we want to learn LGBTI issues. So we have to be, don't let our, the closed, you know, our narrow vision then limit, as, as Michael was also saying, you know, what, what we think is appropriate. Yeah, so to have a, a really, uh, a firmly grounded idea of what is age appropriate. Don't pull back too much, but also maybe don't push too much, but really be make an informed decision about what is appropriate. If I can maybe add a little bit to that, because a lot of people, we're just growing up in this internet era, right? And the ways, you can tell it already in the States, right? These issues are much less um, tra controversial to young people than older people. And part of that is because of the way we communicate and the technology and the forms that we use to communicate, right? Um, and so maybe moving forward, what we might think is age inappropriate is not for in their standpoints because they're already maybe being exposed to it or have some way that they've been they've been incorporated or have touched somebody that's been um, around these issues that we don't even know about or not even in our field of view, right? But the problem is they may have been exposed to it, but they may not be at the right level of cognitive development to process that's that. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, that's what you were trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. With younger learners, I feel it's also how we present things. Um, we had a, a news company come in a, a few years ago, if you recall, in the box of crayons. The, the Japan called One Color skin or whatever the tone was. It was a very hot topic 
two years ago. And uh, so they were coming there and they had the newscaster. She was walking around and she was interviewing, she wanted to interview our students. And we thought it'd be a good thing, but we were also, my teachers and myself were very protective of how she was gonna present it. Um, because a, a child has no preconceived notions. He doesn't, I mean, they don't have things unless it's been given to them or done. So, you know, she's walking around and she were to say, why don't you want to call this this or why should we not say that? The kid wouldn't know you shouldn't say that, you know, until you said that. Now the kid's like, well, wait a second, something's wrong with that. And then all these other things, the domino effects takes place. Um, so I think just with younger learners, at any time we go to, to you know, teach them something or especially show them unbiased, we create more bias just sometimes by how we present them if we don't be very careful and cognizant of those things. And so that's what we're always trying to make our teachers aware of, especially at our school because it's a full immersion program and it's a full subject, everything from the textbook. We have science books, math books, and half of them we look through nowadays. 20 years ago, it was normal for me growing up, but now like, wow, I can just see how you plant those seeds now. And in 10 years, he thinks this shouldn't be called that for some reason he doesn't know about. But if we wouldn't have started that and presented it just in a very neutral way, I'm sometimes trying to be neutral, we make the problem more simple. Maybe. I have a question for Kim. <laughs> One of the problems uh, in job is that a lot of the teachers, um, high school teachers, for example, or a kind of teachers, they believe that no, job is not for me because it's like maybe for university teachers. How um, your sick and can help and tell them that no, the job is for everyone. <laughs> I, I mean, that's why one of the reasons I got involved in the city is because I, I joined Jout. I mean, to be honest, we're all we're so busy here. You no know, one has extra time, but I joined Jout just as a kind of to be a, an example to, to my staff. Hey, let's be more mm -hmm. than just the teacher. You know, in Japan, there's I say there's two types of teachers. There's the kind you can let's say you're out having a drink at a bar. And you need one kind, what do you do? I'm a teacher, you know, like meaning they're getting by for a couple of years while they're traveling. And you know, when I ran schools in Thailand, Southeast Asia it was full of those. And then you have the other kind of teachers. What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a teacher, I teach a so and so, you know. Um, my job is to try to turn all my teachers into those ones, even if they didn't have that background. Uh, out of my staff, probably, you know, only 10 of them are true. Like, I went to school in America for education, I got my certificate, and then I decided to come here. The other ones are great, phenomenal people, but that wasn't their mindset. So I'm trying to turn them. So I joined Jump. I joined Jump, and we got 12 of our staff to join. And you know, we're like, holy cow, it's a lot of money. Well, all right, let's do it. So we all joined. And then we, were, we got here, we're like, what the heck? There's nowhere for us to go. So then we went to all these plenaries, and this is great, and my staff is amazed. And, you know, and we're sitting there, you know, hearing research examples of 1972 to 1994. They surveyed 6,000 kids. And my staff's looking at me and I'm like, I'm sorry you're not with your family. Um, so that's why we got involved and, and on the committee now it's you know one of you know me, the coordinator, my membership chair is uh, one of my head teachers at one of my campuses, and another one's involved in volunteers. So most events we go to, it's kind of like our team trying to help them. Um, but I so I think that's why we got involved. So back to that, we're trying to bring more exposure, more awareness. The Jout Junior this last year, I think, was a great example. I think the, the teachers and, and uh, Mary Beth, they really took ownership and they got a great venue and a great, uh, a lot of great speakers out there. Um, and what, what young learners want to see is they want to see the hands on. You know, uh, they don't want to hear about the research. They don't, I mean, that's, don't get me wrong, that's, that's great. <laughs> but when you're dealing with five year olds and it ever changes, you, you want to do, I want tactics from, you know, these guys that we all know their names that work in the areas. I want to see the hands-on stuff. I want to know that I can take this to my school tomorrow to find a way to get through the six-hour workday because these kids are driving me crazy. <laughs> you know, so uh, I think more hands-on stuff, um, not so much theory, but what are we going to do? And that's what I love when I walk into a classroom uh, or one of the events last year and all the teachers, these adults are standing up and they're that's what that's what my that's what our guys want. So we're trying to really get that exposure out there. I just am in the city 
teach it, and I completely agree with you, and I want more stuff I can take to class on Monday. Yeah. yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a, there's a market, and there's, there's the great to know the research. research. Fascinating stuff. But right. I'm, I'm a firm believer in application rather than pure random yeah. Following up along this line, I think another part of this issue is that JOLT doesn't trap Japanese teachers. Yes. Um, and that's, I think, a place that it goes beyond the young learners. Like, although there's a huge population of Japanese senior senior high school teachers, elementary school teachers now. Um, and I think this is actually something for us in teacher development to say, is what can we do for Japanese elementary, elementary school teachers um, that's going to interest them, bring them in, uh, attract them, and make them feel like this is worthwhile for them. Um, so I think that's, you know, it's, you know, it, it cuts across your sig and our sig. I think this is something we could do together. Um, I also thought it was interesting, Jerry, that you said that, because my understanding was that, that people could join chapters individually, but not SIGs. Yeah, I'm interested in knowing more about that, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine we could attract people to the teacher development SIG who wouldn't necessarily want to become full members of all this population of Japanese school teachers. 2,000 yen is affordable. 12, 13,000. That's the best investment. It does come with limitations. For example, if you're only a member of the SIG but not of JALT, you can't be on the executive board, for example. Um, oh, so there are oh, limitations. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. to self-promote, um, because I know I'm going to be conference here, but uh, please make sure that you come to this afternoon's plenary conversation in particular. The two people that are going to be talking, uh, Satomi uh, works with elementary school teachers and training elementary school teachers, and um, uh, Teresa is going to be talking about FETJ. That's a lot of ALTs, it's a lot of elementary school teachers. There's a lot of these, like everything that you were saying, everything that he was saying, um, they're going to be talking about that this afternoon. And one of the things I wanted to make sure happened this year at Pan State was to give those voices a microphone. Because I do think if we're producing research, if we're doing these things, but we don't hear people saying what you are saying right now, then no one's going to find, they're going to feel there's no, there's no audience for these things. And there very clearly is. So uh, thank you for saying what you're saying. The last year we brought up uh, six, six of our Japanese staff to jump. And the year before this, we brought up 12. And unfortunately, it was kind of like as great as that as they had, it was kind of like, I could understand, you know, the English is fine, but it is hard to comprehend, you know, as fast as we can pay. So, you know, I don't know what percentage of our membership is Japanese, but I wish we could have equal have percentage of J Japanese based lectures and seminars and things. I want to be able to come up here and say, all right, you guys, you go to the it sounds weird to say this, but you go to the Japanese section, we'll go to this section, they go listen to those things that they can comprehend and learn. I mean, all these questions about how elementary change is coming by Max, people are asking me, and I'm like, we don't need the help. They're the ones that need the help in these changes. So let, let's facilitate that and let's have some forms set up for that. But also, if they can get more support from Max, I that work because it's kind of sure. sometimes. They've got more obligations, less time during summer, less time during the holiday, less support for that. But I mean, you're right, because yeah. there there's so many great teachers that could share ideas in their own language, you know, that would work and maybe draw people over. I was a high school English teacher um, for 10 years. And um, I think, uh, first of all, I think there are several possible reasons why Japanese teachers in English in that um, get involved with Joel. First of all, um, they actually don't know the existence of Joel. Mm -hmm. And uh, all, the, all the professional developmental opportunities given to the secondary schools, elementary schools, public schools, are at least unknown, um, conducted by board of education, local boards of education. So maybe the partnership with the board of education would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, as you everyone knows, the workers of the secondary schools are extremely uh, a lot of workers, and on weekends they have club activities and uh, community work to do, and they would be able to afford to give extra time to join um, something additional 
where you really need to be recognized as, for example, qualifications or the monetary uh, benefits or anything like that. So to give up the private time on top of all the work they have to do on a daily basis is extremely difficult. So when I was in, uh, actively involved with the Akita chapter, uh, the Jot uh, joint some events and conferences. I was the only Japanese teacher of English in terms of the high school, junior high, and elementary. Um, language side is also, of course, a problem, but that can be managed, <coughs> I think. It's more about the development of opportunity, awareness, and uh, some kind of perks they need to make that extra effort. Um, so, yeah, that would be some of the things to do. <coughs> to, to, to add to that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go Is it okay? Make sure, you sure? Um, uh, thinking from the disruptive aspect of that, um, the language is how do we bring people here? How do we attract people, right? So when thinking about introducing new technology, there's always this buy-in that you have to get people to use this new thing, right? So the strategy often is, is what are they already doing and how do I introduce this new tool in a way that matches their already known behavior? So thinking about a conference and getting people to a conference may not be necessarily the right thinking when trying to attract especially busy high school Japanese teachers. There may be some sort of outreach or some sort of, like I mentioned, uh, collaboration with local boards of education or something that happens on site or some virtual type of conference where people can join at their leisure and have some on-demand content perhaps mm -hmm. so they can kind of consume it uh, at their leisure and when they need it, want it. Also, maybe some kind of social events where they don't necessarily feel the need to have the knowledge about, let's say, empirical research or mm. um, because we feel as a Japanese teacher, especially working in secondary schools, when we are going into events like where there are all these researchers and scholars, we don't we don't feel we have anything uh, um, beneficial to say to that community at all. Mm -hmm. It's like. Yeah, it's, it will be always passive, but whereas if there are some social events where we can frankly talk about uh, general issues, that, um, that are actually of importance to the researchers, that's the thing the in-service teachers do not realize. Mm. So, yeah, maybe some kind of social events from the ground up, or I don't know, yeah. One other idea that you're, uh, idea you've given me here is that at Osaka University, I also do uh, faculty development for our TLSC, our Teaching and Learning Support Center. But then I also teach actually in the Open University, um, where we do uh, run courses for elementary, junior, and high school teachers who are refreshing their teaching certificates. Um, and um, I don't know if there's any way that JOLT could hook up with those kinds of things, right? Where the teachers have to come for their, you know, their certificate refresher anyway, uh, or because I think we might have a little materials exhibition or something, you know. Um, so maybe we should think about that. I think it might become easier too because JOLT, uh, the, the Japanese government is currently discussing like actually how teachers work, particularly in junior and senior high schools, and they're actually having a debate right now about club activities and those types because teachers aren't getting paid for that and it's not really voluntary so they're trying to decide what is that. Is it voluntary or it's are they paying them? So they might actually have some more free time in the future because they are incredibly overdue. But the thing is with the monetary issue with, uh, with regard to the club activities, the teachers only get up to 1,300 yen for how many hours, yeah, they, how many more hours yeah. they work. So on one weekend, even if you invest, let's say, 12 hours, 18 hours, you only get 1,500 yen. So, so it's almost better to say, I don't want to take the money, so don't make me do the extra work. Yeah, but so it allows you to say no. Oh, sorry for that. No, no, no. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> Um, so on behalf of the teacher development team, we'd like to say a huge thank you for being part of our forum today, and also thank you for coming. And um, we're, we're hoping to somehow um, document what was talked about today in maybe the proceedings. So we've recorded the whole session, and we'll try and organise our ideas into a piece of some sort. So thank you.
Can you just ask a quick question? How many people here are members of East State? How many people are here from Young Learners State, are members of Young Learners? How many people are members of Yale? <laughs> How many people are members of Mayberg? Right? And you might think, oh, those numbers are small in each group, but the fact is you're all in one place, and we're having this conversation together. And that's really the important thing, that all of us are talking about all this. And notice it, it went essentially off in a completely different direction here at the end about making the goal a more inclusive organization overall. Um, and that's the real value of doing conversations like this. I think it's really important. And I think we can commit that we'll, we'll do this again next year at Penn State with a different group of cities. Um, and you should come even if you're not a member of one of those cities. Okay? We'll look forward to seeing you then. Um, so, um, today I think was a great platform for these SIGs, and it also gives you a kind of sense of the way we like to structure teacher development at TD SIG. Um, if you're into this kind of um, casual, conversational, um, reflective, uh, teacher development, then please consider coming to Teacher Journeys next month. Uh, this is the seventh year. Uh, it's our second time partnering with Tokyo Jump.